start this off with a little bit of guilt. I, I wrote that on the page. <laughs> I, I, I don't know what came over me, but uh, I feel at this point in time, I need to at least confess. So, um, yeah, this is uh, uh, my last night, at least uh, teaching and stuff. We're moving uh, four or so hours away, so um, it, it's not going to be very practical to come back. I'd love to. Uh, I can tell you that uh, um, Calvary Baptist Church, and, and in particular the bridge, has, has meant a lot to me. Um, I have uh, grown in my relationship with God as a result of you all. I have uh, formed bonds with brothers and sisters down here that um, are um, difficult to uh, walk away from, I guess, you know, in terms of moving um, it, it uh, you know, I thought that we're, you know, we're gonna move to Bastrop. We'll be there a couple of years and go back home. No big deal. It's kind of in and out thing, you know, like a drive-through window at a McDonald's or something. But, but uh, we stayed uh, actually longer, and uh, and y'all mean a, mean a lot to us. And and so I would encourage you to um, continue your walk, continue your development, continue this 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 uh, young adult group because I've been to and seen a lot of churches, and they don't have this. I don't know why, but, but they just don't have it. This is something that's very special. Even in, in like the big cities, you don't see it and stuff like that. So I, I encourage you all to uh, uh, keep up with that. We love you all, and we're going to miss you in intently. I'm not really sure what the booing was, by the way. I'll take it as something good. <laughs> uh, anyway, uh, tonight, uh, in the topic of uh, take action, I, I wanted to talk about something that is uh, an understandable, easy concept in the Bible. And, and often the, the things that the Bible uh, teaches us on, on what we're to do are, are often easy to understand. Not necessarily easy to do, but easy to understand. You know, pray without ceasing. Pray always. Well, that's pretty easy to understand. Love your neighbors as yourself. Love your God with all your heart and your mind and soul. Um, 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 study God's word and things like that. So there's there's the concepts are really easy to understand, but often due to our sinful nature and and all are sometimes difficult to actually uh, implement. And I'm going to talk about one of those. And uh, I want to talk about because our, our topic is take action. And before we take action, there's something that we need to do. So before you uh, go on some mission trip, before you uh, serve in the ministry, before you serve at church, before you start a vibrant uh, prayer life, there's one thing that we need to do, and that is to make a, a serious commitment to the Lord, a serious commitment to the Lord. So I read through the Bible, I, I say I'm on the yearly plan, but it really turns out to be the two and a half year plan. <laughs> um, um, and I was in Joshua a few months back when uh, after I had given all the notes and stuff for what I thought I was going to talk about, and God just shifted the whole thing uh, to same topic, but but a, but a different approach. And but anyway, I was reading through Joshua, and in verse uh, 15 of chapter 24, it says, "Choose this day whom you will serve, whether the gods of your fathers served in the region beyond the river, or the gods of the Amorites in wh whose land you dwell." But as for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. That is the initial commitment we need to make, is to commit to say, yes, me and my house, we are going to serve the Lord. And so the little bit of background, the Israelites were at this point in time wandering through uh, the desert after the exodus from Egypt. And... Um, uh, this is at the end of that wandering, and they're about to go into the promised land, the inheritance 
was already established, the land was already allotted, and Joshua gives the Israelites a warning in the form of a decision that they need to make. Choose this day who you will serve. Whether it be for pagan gods, but as for me and my house, I choose to serve the Lord. The first thing we should do before we take any kind of action, before we, we, we get involved in the ministry, we need to make that stance. So before you serve, you need to make the commitment that you will be serving God and God only. Now, some of you have already may have made that commitment and are still solid in that stance. Others have made, maybe have made that commitment years back and are start waffling between uh, how seriously you're going to do it and maybe you need to re, uh, reaffirm, recommit to that. Others, you may be still on the fence deciding what level of commitment of service that you want to do for the Lord. But I encourage you to make it resolute that for me and my house, we're going to choose to serve the Lord. And if you notice, when Joshua said that, he didn't mention any middle ground, right? It was either serve these pagan gods or serve God, the true and living God. There wasn't a kind of do what you want. No middle ground, no neutral stance. Uh, it's either serve God or, or serve the enemy. So the person says, well, I'm just kind of doing my own thing. I, I'm, I'm not serving God, but I'm not opposing God. That's how I grew up, by the way, in, in a very non-Christian environment, but, but still a, a loving environment. It wasn't a, a difficult uh, or harsh environment. It just was void of things spiritual. Uh, but... Satan uses that misdirection. Satan uses that apathy as a tool to get people not to serve God. So that you may think you're taking a middle ground or a neutral stance, but in reality, you're taking a stance to serve yourself and, and not God. And by the way, this is not the only time that's mentioned in the Bible. Elijah, right before, uh, it was right when he was challenging the prophets of Baal to, to get Baal to consume the altar and then he was going to uh, um, get uh, uh, or have God consume his altar. Um, and um, it's really kind of funny the way he challenges him and stuff. But nonetheless, he says uh, to the Jews, he says, how long will you be limping between two different opinions? If the Lord is God, follow him. But if Baal is, then follow him. He wasn't given any middle ground. You either, either follow God or you follow Baal. Uh, Jesus, later on in the Summer of the Mount says something also very similar. Matthew 6.24, it says, No one can serve two masters, for either he will hate the one and love the other, or he will de be devoted to one and despise the other. You cannot serve God and money. There's no middle ground. You're either going to serve God, or you're going to serve something of this world. Paul, later on, in Romans 8.8, 8, says, Those who are in the flesh cannot please God. So if someone is in the flesh, if someone says, yeah, I'm going to live for myself, he cannot please God. There's no middle ground of satisfying the flesh and, and having a good relation with God and pleasing God. It's one or the other. And I encourage you. I implore you. I, I beseech you. If, you. if you read Shakespeare, you'll get that word a lot. To, to, to follow God, to make that commitment to serve God. It is, it is a life-changing thing. Now, sometimes it'll be easy. And sometimes it'll be, it'll be difficult. It'll be a challenge. You'll have peer pressure. You'll have uh, a desire to not necessarily serve God. But I encourage you to, to do that. Uh, and you, you may not have an easy life, but you'll have a blessed life. You, you may not have all the pleasures of this world, but you'll have a peace and a purpose that only God can provide. You'll have stability. Now, maybe not around you, maybe falling apart, but, but internally, you'll have stability and peace. So I wanted to go over two people, Saul, let's go to Saul, uh, and then uh, another guy. Saul, as you know, was the first uh, king of um, Israel, and um, when, is, when the Jews were exiting uh, Egypt again, the Amalekites attacked them, and that's in uh, Exodus 17. 8 to 16. So at this time, when Saul is king, I'm up to Samuel chapter 15, and God makes note of what 
uh, Amalekites did. And he gives a command to the Israelites to destroy the Amalekites. And that is uh, utter destruction. That means uh, everyone dies, men, women, children, all livestock, everything gets destroyed. It's like it's vaporized, gone from the earth type destruction. And so Saul is given a great victory by God, and he uh, um, kills um, the, the, the people as commanded by God. He kills the livestock. However, he keeps King Agog alive, which is a king of the Malachites. And he also keeps the best of the sheep, the lambs, and the cattle, um, the, all the things that are good. But he, he devotes to destruction all the rest of the people and all the things that weren't so good or, as the Bible calls, worthless. Um, so God, uh, right after that happens, uh, Samuel, who's the prophet, wasn't in that same area. He was in a different area. And God goes to Samuel and basically says, you need to go talk to Saul. Um, you know, I kind of regret uh, making him king. Something's happening. It's not good. You need to go talk to him. Um, and um, Samuel is angry. He cries out to the Lord through the night. Uh, at the same time, Saul, with his army, they're making a uh, monument to himself at, uh, at, because of the victory. So Saul is with his army. He sees uh, Samuel approaching, and he says in uh, 1 Samuel 15, 13, he says, Blessed be you to the Lord. I have performed the commandment of the Lord. And Samuel responds, what then is this bleating of sheep in my ears and the lowing of oxen that I hear? Which is kind of like he's jabbing at Saul. He says, Saul says, I've done, it. I've done what the Lord commanded me to do. And then Samuel goes, you know, he's thinking, well, you're supposed to kill all the livestock, and, but I hear sheep and I hear cattle. What's going on? What the what? And um, Saul then responds to him to that. And he says, uh, that they brought them from the Malachites for the people spared the best of the sheep and the oxen to sacrifice to the Lord. So I didn't do everything that God commanded me to do, but I, I'm going to sacrifice the Lord. I disobeyed God, but it was for God's benefit. And Samuel says, stop. Stop. That's enough. And he, he says something very profound. Samuel chastens Saul and he says, as the Lord as great a delight in burnt offerings and sacrifices as in obeying the voice of the Lord. Behold, it's better to it's behold to obey is better than sacrifice. Obedience is better than sacrifice. So from this story about Saul, we can get two things. One is God wants uh, you completely. He doesn't want part of you. From the world's perspective, Saul, Saul probably did an A-minus job. He did 99% of what God asked, right? So he would have been a hero. He would have been exalted for doing what God had asked. But from God's perspective, it's 100%. It's not 99%. It's 100%. God doesn't want just part of us. He doesn't want just our leftover time or excess money or part of our talents and stuff. He wants everything. We, you know, when they were asked to give a sacrifice, was it the lame sheep that was about ready to die anyway, or was it a, a choice lamb that was actually good and healthy? It was the, it was the better one, the preferred one. I, I served with Mission Arlington on uh, short-term mission trips. So we were in Richardson in Arlington, so I really, not a, I mean, we stayed there, but, but it was very close. Nonetheless, uh, what the teens and, and I did is we got this truck, and, and it wasn't like a pickup truck. It was one, I call it a bread truck. I don't know if that's accurate, but it's one of those like Amazon looking delivery trucks. And thinking that this guy can drive one of those trucks, I mean, that is, that's a miracle in itself right there. Uh, I, as a matter of fact, I remember that I told them because there was only like two seats and two seat belts, and I've got like four or five teams in the back, and I said, okay grab hold of something because I don't want you flying around. And one of the teens had a clever idea. He sat down in a folding chair and he roped himself to the folding chair. So as I'm taking a turn in the rear view mirror, I see a guy just sliding one side to the other. Oh, God, please protect us. So anyway, we're asked to go get a couch. And so we uh, go and get this couch. And this couch was sitting on someone's porch. It was covered in a tarp. It was a ratty old couch. I mean, they thought they, that maybe they're giving a couch, 
But in reality, we're just taking away their trash. So I bring the couch back to Mission Arlington, and they yell at me for, why did you bring this couch? It's going to cost us money to dispose of it. It it's actually has no value. I, I said, well, you know, I'm sorry, but, but if you had told me the criteria on what was a good versus bad couch, I would have left it behind. Uh, but what I get from this story is that person, did they really give something to God? Did, did they, or did they, did they find a way for someone to dispose of their trash? You know? And, and I'm okay with you giving things to God. Me personally, they say, I wouldn't pay you. I'm okay with myself giving things to God, but it has to be useful things. It has to be something that's really going to benefit the person that's going to get it, whether that be new. I don't mind buying new stuff myself. I, I buy a lot of clothes at thrift stores and, and uh, used stuff on, on eBay and stuff like that. That's not a problem, you know, because everything kind of has its value. But when you give something to God, it's got to be something that actually has value. It has to be a sacrifice. God wants obedience. God wants, wants us all. The second thing we learn from that, which is what Samuel said at the very end, is that obedience is better than sacrifice. The, the fact that we've made a stance that says, for me and my house, I will follow the Lord, that is being obedient to God, to put him as Lord of your life. And how often do people, uh, and I was in this trap years ago, and I really, it's kind of a confession, but, but, uh, but I was serving God and still harboring a sin. And, and serving and being obedient to God, but it's still saying living in, in disobedience is a, a losing game. It, it eats you up internally. It destroys your relationship with God. And, and eventually, just you're like this hollow husk. And um, that's why obedience, to, to make that commitment that, yes, me and my house, we're going to serve the Lord, is the first thing you do then you provide time and effort and stuff to God. Okay, second person we're going to talk about is Daniel. There we go. So um, Judah fell to Babylon. It was conquered by Babylon, 606 B.C., during the time where Jeconiah was king. Interesting enough, it was something that Isaiah prophesied uh, in Isaiah 39, verses 6 and 7. But to give you a little bit more perspective, in 2 Kings chapter 20, the king at that time was Hezekiah, and he became deathly ill. I mean, so sick that he thought he was going to die. He prays, God heals him, God gives him, I can't remember, like 10, 15 more years of life, and Babylon sends an envoy to kind of congratulate him and, and say, you know, glad you're uh, healthy and well and all. At this time, Babylon is just a, like a little tiny city-state, not significant at all. And Hezekiah shows him that envoy uh, from Babylon, all the gold and silver and everything in, in Jerusalem. He didn't hide anything from him. He showed him everything. Uh, after they leave, Isaiah comes back and said, what'd you do? And he said, he told him exactly what he did and said, okay, because you did that, um, Babylon will eventually uh, conquer you. And then Hezekiah was all kind of worried that it would happen during his lifetime. And then when he found out it was, it'll happen later, he goes, eh, okay, <laughs> not my problem. And, but sure enough, 105 years later, King Nebuchadnezzar, who just assumed the throne of the Babylon Empire, and the empire is expanding prior to that, reaches the edge of uh, Judea and conquers Judea. Now, the way Nebuchadnezzar kind of worked the system is he would grab... Uh, a handful of young men and then train them in the ways of the Babylonians so they could serve in his court. So when they conquered Judea, they grabbed Daniel, Hananiah, Azariah, and Mishael. Those four people they brought in with the idea that they're going to train them over three years. And at the end of three years, they would serve as advisors uh, to the king. And they're and they looking for the very best. They want the strongest, smartest, best looking, and healthiest, and stuff like that. And those, these four men were, young men were represented. I say young men. They were actually teens. They were probably 15 or 16 years old at the time. Very, very young. After three years, that means they were 18 or 19. So at age 18 or 19, uh, at the age that 
an American would be graduating high school, these people are serving before a king, and a king that was a despot. Despot meaning that his word was law. If he decided he didn't like you, you were done with, period. It didn't matter if it was justification or not. It, it, he had that kind of power. So anyway, during this period of time, the eunuch was providing them meat and wine to sustain them. And, and Daniel said, no, this is defiling us, so we're not going to eat the meat or don't want to eat the meat. Now, maybe it was that the meat was not kosher. You know, maybe they were, you know, serving them shrimp and bacon or something. I don't know. I'd be okay with that personally. But, but uh, nonetheless, maybe it wasn't kosher. Could have been sacrificed to, uh, to pagan gods. That was common practice in that area. Carried all the way into the New Testament because the early Christians struggled with the same thing. Should I eat meat that's sacrificed to idols or, or not? Um, but that's a whole other story. Nonetheless, whatever it was, uh, it was going to defile Daniel, and he didn't want to do it. And uh, he purposed in his heart to serve God for me. In my household, I will serve God. And so he didn't want to eat the meat. Well, uh, they're in a little bit of a predicament. Uh, the the um, pure pressure for them was to eat it. I mean, we suffer from the same thing. I mean, do we, do we cave to small things uh, that may interfere with our walk and with God, our relationship with God, just to get along with the crowd? Uh, or do we stand resolute and know I, I am going to serve God. I mean, that's, that, that is something we all uh, fall to, that pressure, potential temptation, and, and possible bad decisions. Nonetheless, he was resolute, not going to do it. He offers up an a, a alternate dietary uh, plan of eating vegetables and, and water, and the eunuch goes, no, 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 I'm not sure about this, because he was worried about if, if you eat veggies for a week and then you go in all skinny and, 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 and um, malnutritioned and look bad, uh, I will suffer. I'll lose my position. I'll, I'll, I will be punished. I'll go to jail. I'll lose. My head will be severed from my body, <laughs> which I'd like to keep attached. Um, um, so Daniel said, okay, we'll do a test. Ten days. And uh, if we look good at that point, then we're good to go for the rest of the time. And God blessed him. But, but keep in mind, Daniel was resolute in his position, and then God blessed him with keeping him healthy and trim and all with a veggie, no meat uh, diet, which would be tough, I think. But, but nonetheless, it's good for him. Uh, God blessed his obedience. So King Nebuchadnezzar, when these, after three years, he was very impressed. He said, these guys are, are the, the higher wisdom, understanding than other advisors. They're 10 times better than everyone else. So where God uh, blessed Daniel because he was standing and serving God just where God wanted him to be, and God, God blessed him for that. Let's fast forward uh, from chapter 1 to chapter 6. And in that five short chapters, 70 years have transpired. So uh, things have changed. The, the Babylonian kingdom has now collapsed and was taken over by the Medo-Persian Empire. And King Darius is now uh, the king and not uh, Nebuchadnezzar and, and the other uh, Babylonian kings. Uh, Daniel is probably pushing 90 years at this point. So he's, even from my perspective, he's an old man, which has got to be pretty old. Uh, uh, anyway, uh, the, whole, the whole organization is run by 120 what they call satraps, uh, which were leaders. And those 120 leaders were... Uh, had three high officials over them, and Daniel was uh, above them all. So Daniel was like a very key person, not like king key person, but he was a very key person in terms of the, the administration and running of the uh, government and society and stuff. And the other guys, I guess, were getting jealous because they wanted to take him down. And they tried to find fault in what he did, but they didn't find anything, which means Daniel was, was living a, a good life. He wasn't uh, you know, cheating and stealing or anything like that. He, he was living just the way he needed to have lived. And so they couldn't find fault in what he was doing, but they reasoned that he was, since he was a, a solid believer in uh, Jehovah, 
that they could maybe catch him in some way with the law of, of his God. And so they schemed a little law that they got King Darius to sign that for 30 days, everyone in the kingdom had to uh, petition or, or pray uh, to only King Darius. So another way of word is that no one could petition or to any god or man for 30 days except King Darius. And he must have had a pretty good ego. He, without really thinking through, signed it. Uh, where Nebuchadnezzar was a despot and could, uh, didn't have to follow the law, apparently Darius was a little bit less powerful because once he signed something in the law, he had to uh, follow it. So anyway, Daniel, who was the leader, knew that law. He knew it was signed. He knew it was in fact. If you broke the law, you were thrown into the a den of lions. So he knew the consequences of that law. Uh, but Daniel had a practice. He had a strong prayer life. He prayed three times a day. And, and so he knew the law. He knew the consequences. So after the law was in power, in effect, he goes up to his upper room. He opens his window facing Jerusalem. He kneels down and he prays. He doesn't go off and change his routine and prays in some closet and keeps it secret. He prays right in the window for people to see. And I don't think for the purpose of people to see, but he had a routine to pray to God in a certain way, and he kept with that routine. And, uh, of course, they saw him. They brought it to the king's attention. King Darius can't change the law, can't change the effects, so he was thrown into the lion's den. As everybody know, he survived the lion's den. Uh, but the king was very distraught. Uh, as a side note, the, once it all settled, the people that accused him, they were thrown into the lion's den. And, and it says that their bones were broken before they hit the ground. Now, I don't know what lions do, but, but that's pretty drastic. Anyway, Daniel uh, knew that the consequences were death if he stayed in obedience to God, if he stayed in his service to God. It was no different than his three friends that were thrown into the fiery furnace in chapter 3. They knew that if they didn't bow down to the golden statue, that they would be thrown into the fire furnace, which most people would think of as death, but they didn't die. Uh, but both, both times, and, and we're kind of focused on Daniel, he, he knew the effect, he knew the consequence, he knew that uh, death was a potential, uh, yet he still remained resolute in serving God. So Daniel started young in a, in a steadfast service to God, and he ended uh, serving God. So he started good and he ended good. We too have that choice, just like Daniel, to make a stance. Choose this day who you will serve. But as for me and my house, right, kiddo? <laughs> we will serve the Lord. Now, like I said, there's no middle ground. You're either going to serve God or you're going to serve the enemy or yourself or the world or others, but all of those are not uh, serving God. Um, now, what does kind of serving God look like? Well, it's, it's placing God as Lord of your life. It, it's a, allowing God to mold and shape and change you into that Christian man and woman he wants you to be. It, it includes the purpose, the plan, the identity that Christ has for you, and it's unique to you. It's uh, following the, the, some of the simple commands that are outlined in the Bible to make disciples, to, to love our neighbors, to pray, to study his word, uh, and to serve them in some capacity. But that service starts with us individually making that stance, making the decision that for me and my household, I will serve the Lord. Let's pray. Lord, we just thank you for your word. We thank you, Lord, that those concepts in the Bible, although they may be hard to uh, completely fulfill in our life because we do live in, in this body that is prone to sin, that we have a propensity to sin, uh, but Lord, your commands are, and your desires for us are, are simple in nature. And I pray, Lord, that uh, we would make a firm stance, to, that we would commit to put you as Lord of our life and to serve you all the days of our life. And Lord, I pray that you would uh, mitigate temptation, 
be, uh, so that it's not ab above what we can bear, as your word tells us, that you would give us a way out and that we would be mindful, Lord, of those things that we are to do and to say they're in perfect alignment with your will and that we avoid doing and avoid saying those things that are not in line with your will, that we do walk that path, Lord, that you have put before us in the identity that you give us, Lord. We love you and we thank you, Jesus. Amen. Thank you.